Good evening, everyone. Thank you once again for joining. We are going to get started now. So just a quick few housekeeping items before we start. Um, there is a chat function at the bottom. So if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in. Um, we will address them as always in a Q&A at the end. Um, so once again, thank you so much for joining. Today, we are going to talk about values-based investing. So how to align your money with what matters to you. Um, before we get started, our legal department, we have to keep them happy. So a quick disclaimer for those of you who have been on our last webinars, you'll be quite familiar with what we're going to say. Um, the, the gist of it is really, this is meant for, to be educational. It's not meant to be construed as financial advice. Um, so please, anything presented in this slideshow is just for illustrative purposes. Um, please consult your financial advisor or professional advisor before you make any decisions. Um, so that is really the gist of these disclaimers here. So today's agenda, we'll start with quickly defining what is values-based investing. We'll go through a few different strategies on how values-based investing is implemented. Then we'll talk about some of the problems with values-based investing. And we'll go through next what actually works, so what we can do about those problems. We'll talk a little bit about values-based investing and the performance of those kinds of investments. And finally, we'll touch on some other ways to align your values with your money aside from your investments. All right, Derek, why don't you take us through what is values-based investing? All right, values-based investing has a whole bunch of different names. Uh, we're gonna throw a bunch of them up on the screen here. ESG investing, environmental, social, governmental, uh, socially responsible investing, ethical investing, responsible investing, activist investing, impact investing. You can probably come up with uh, a bunch of other names as well. But we're going to focus on one called ESG investing. The, and we'll take a deeper dive into the environmental, social, and governance issues. That's what the ESG stands for. So I'll let Christian run you through those uh, individual letters. Thanks, Derek. So really, the, what these different names all mean is, is aligning in your investments with your values. And when we look at it, we like to use ESG in our terminology because it, it really represents the different factors that they incorporate when they look at values. So the E for E in ESG stands for environmental. So this is looking at things like, how does the company have an impact on climate change, either positively or negatively? How do they use natural resources? Do they pollute a lot or produce a lot of waste? What other environmental opportunities are they taking advantage of? You know, so what is the company's impact on the environment as a whole? Then another aspect is social. So the S stands for social. So this is more social justice related issues, things like home, uh, human rights, et cetera. Finally, we look at governance. So governance is more how is the company actually run? looking at the board of directors, the C-suite executives, have they been involved in bribery, corruption scandals? How does the company handle data privacy? This is a big one, especially in, in our new COVID world with everyone moving digital. You know, looking at data privacy policies is a really important thing because we wanna make sure companies are respecting how we deal with, uh, how they deal with our data. Derek, anything to add on those three factors? Oh, those are, are great factors. And again, the hard part of any of these things is we're talking about a global marketplace, many different ethnic backgrounds, different governing bodies. And so what we might think is really good in North America, people in other parts of the world uh, may have a completely different opinion on it. So it's a little hard, uh, but we're going to do our best to show you a couple of ways of how you can at least try and, and uh, factor in some of these things into your investing picture. All right, Dave, so why don't you take us through implementing ESG with screens? Okay, screens. Well, screens, uh, we're all familiar with screens. It's coming up to, to uh, black fly and mosquito season. That's uh, the good thought is that we're gonna have nice warm weather. The bad thought is that there could be black flies and mosquitoes all over the place. But, uh, the screens have a positive and a negative. They, the positive is they keep the flies and the mosquitoes out. Uh, and then we'll get to the negatives in a minute. But so when we're looking at positive screens, what we're looking for is we're looking at individual companies and how they are, are doing in these specific areas. So uh, environmental impact, we looked at, at companies 
that are having a positive impact on climate change, uh, alternative energy sources, wind farms, uh, solar energy farms, uh, companies that are energy efficient, uh, green buildings, all those kind of things related to climate change. Uh, how are they uh, treating the, uh, the environment from using the use of resources? Uh, water use is a, a, a big one. And also, are they uh, big polluters or are they uh, doing a very good job of minimizing the, the waste that they have? And then social impact, uh, we look at basic needs. How are they helping or hindering? So these are positive screens. So these would be companies that are uh, helping uh, battle against uh, proper nutrition in the world, uh, being uh, treating uh, major diseases, uh, proper sanitation, affordable real estate. That almost seems like a joke in uh, Canada right now with all that's going on, the high prices. Uh, affordable real estate might be in the Arctic somewhere, uh, but not too many people want to go there. And then empowerment. Uh, what companies, you know, we hear a lot about uh, the, you know, the equality and so on. But if you look at uh, a lot of the C-suites or the executives, the boards and so on, as, as Christian has talked about, is it's still a lot of white male people at the heads of a lot of these companies. So what are they doing to empower uh, individuals within the corporation from different ethnic backgrounds, male, female, and so on, to, to move up the ladder? And how are they at, uh, are they encouraging small and medium-sized businesses to grow and to hire more people and to give people opportunities? So those are some of the things that uh, people take a, a dive into, people that are using positive screening. So they're looking literally at each individual company uh, in that regard. And then we have the negative, uh, which is sort of the opposite, saying, hey, we're not going to let any of these in. So some examples might be oh, I'm not buying any uh, oil and gas companies because they're big fossil fuels. Uh, they either are producing them or they're heavy manufacturing. So they do a lot of, uh, of pollution. Uh, it could be controversial things like arms dealers. Uh, could be other that would be more of a, a personal moral uh, stands like alcohol, gambling, uh, uh, narcotics, different kinds of things even such things as how power is generated. Uh, it's been in the news quite a bit over the last year or two, the UK and the US, uh, the coal burning fire or uh, coal powered uh, generating plants for electricity are diminishing very quickly. And it's expected that within a few years, there won't be any coal, uh, coal burning power plants, plants in operation in North America or in, in the UK. So those are, again, some negative screens that you just leave those companies totally out. And then Christian, uh, unless I miss something here, he'll talk about the other uh, avenue of implementing. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, no, you, you covered it really well. So positive screens essentially take only the, the good or the best companies out of, it, out of the basket, whereas negative screens get rid of the worst. Uh, the end result is usually fairly similar, but it's kind of two different approaches. One's let's get rid of the the bad guys, and I say that with air quotes. Um, and one says well, let's pick out the good guys. So similar idea, but applied a little bit differently. Another way to implement ESG investing is with what we call tilting. So tilting starts with the market as a whole. So we look at an entire index, and they give every company a rating based on their ESG score. So you can see the, you know, the sample market is, you know, 9% of the companies are ranked as the least sustainable. We've had 10% on the other end that are ranked as the most sustainable and then a, a, a smattering of the other companies in between. So what it does is first, like a negative screen, it's gonna exclude the least sustainable. So they're still gonna get rid of the worst offenders um, and they're gonna underweight some of the below average offenders. So you can see here, below average market is about 19% of the companies. Whereas um, when you look at a sustainable approach or an ESG approach, they're only about 11%. So they reduce the weighting a bit. And then they take that weighting and they apply it more to the more sustainable companies. So you're still well diversified because you're investing in the market as whole and only excluding the least sustainable and even still holding on to some of the below average companies. Um, so it still remains well diversified. Um, we're just getting rid of some of the worst companies and overweighting the, um, the higher ranked companies. Derek, anything to add on tilting? Oh, that's, that's a great thing. And again, as we'll get into uh, shortly, 
the hard part is, is how much do you weigh each one of them, the environment, the social, the governance, and how do you compare companies? Because a mining company is likely going to have a much more terrible environmental impact than a, uh, an accounting firm uh, from that perspective. Uh, but you can have like, let's use forestry as an example. You can have companies that go in and just clear cut and leave uh, just nothing but uh, bare, barren land behind them. And another forestry company that goes in and replants two trees for every tree that they harvest. And so they're into sustainability and so on. So we've got to look at, there's a lot of different things to look at in this area. And Derek, that touches really nicely on one of the main problems with ESG. So when we're looking at ESG, the big one of the biggest issues is looking at how are these companies rated? Who does these rankings? Who create, what criteria are being used? And you can see there was a study that came out of MIT and you can see the scatter plot is, is the results. So all of those little dots represent the rating of a, the ESG score of a particular company. And you can see there was two separate firms that they looked at and they said, what is the correlation? Do, theoretically, if they're all using kind of objective, similar criteria, the rating should be the same. But when you look at some of the outliers, looking at kind of some of these ones down in the bottom corner, you can see firm number one ranked them pretty poorly. Firm number two ranked them pretty highly. So you can see there's, well, there's still a general pattern up forming kind of a diagonal line up the middle, which is what we would expect to see. Um, you can see there's quite a few outliers. So when we're in, investing in an ESG investment fund or product, we have to take a look at whose ratings are they using? What do the, how are those ratings actually measured? How are they compared to other companies' ratings? Because at the end of the day, if we're going to implement this kind of strategy, we want to make sure that we're actually getting an ESG approach. We can, and, and Derek, you had a really great example about uh, electric cars. Do you want to take them through that example? Sure. So Tesla's uh, a company that's very much in the news these days, and they're producing electric cars. And so people say, great, that's a great company. Uh, very little, uh, you know, electric cars. There's, there's no carbon pollution from that. Isn't that wonderful? And that is from that particular aspect of it. But how far do you go down? How much pollution does their plant produce? How environmentally friendly is it? And then you go a little further, the batteries that they use in the, to power the Tesla, uh, they're down at the bottom of the list as far as uh, being poor for the environment. So you've got the, the mining to get the batteries and then the battery disposal. So which aspect are you looking at or how far down the line do you go with that? So Tesla, as far as electric vehicles, great, no carbon emissions. But the plant, oh, that might be, you know, if, if the car part of it is ranked as an A, the plant might be marked as a, a C or C plus and the raw materials, especially the batteries might be marked as an F. Uh, so how do you give them a composite picture of that? Uh, so again, these are all things that we don't have all the answers for, and, and nobody really does. Uh, but the key thing is, is that any of these rating agencies uh, will come up, they're, they can be somewhat objective, but there's still a lot of subjectivity to it. What are they measuring? And who's doing the measuring? What are they comparing it to? That's a great example, Derek. I think it really illustrates the, the kind of the, some of the, the key issues here. Um, so what do we do with that information? So we know that there is an issue. Um, so what works? Well, let's look at the three ESG factors. We're starting with G. So governance, it has a direct influence on how the company runs. But for a lot of people, it just doesn't go far enough. You know, there's a, a, a con an idea or a concept called proxy voting. So when you buy the stock of a company, you're technically a partial owner. So you have a say, depending on the number of shares you have on what the company does. Now, if I buy one share of a company that issues millions of shares, I don't have that much of a say. But if you're a part of an investment company that owns thousands, if not millions of shares in a company, they have a bit of a bigger seat and a bigger voice at the table. So through proxy voting, these larger companies can have some sort of an indirect influence on how the company is run. But once again, for a lot of people, when we're looking at this kind of strategy and ESG strategy, it's just really not enough uh, on its own. 
And then we look at social issues. Social issues are highly personal and really the criteria for measuring the impact is very unclear. You know, you look at a company, um, you know, a lot of, I, I won't name specific names, but a lot of clothing companies, you know, they, they come out with really positive social justice issues um, and they really kind of position themselves as a, as a leader in social justice. But at the end of the day, they're using sweatshop labor and things are being shipped over from other countries and, you know, in, in Asia or India and now these places where their labor laws are, are not nearly as, uh, as strict or have ha as high of standards as we do. So, you know, as, and social values, and, and this kind of touches a bit on what we were talking about earlier, they're very personal. And if you want a great example of how personal social values can be, flip on CNN and then flip over to Fox. They're, they may be talking about the same issue, but they're gonna have very different perspectives. So, you know, who's, who's setting these social values? What criteria are they using? It's very difficult for a company who's trying to do this for thousands or millions of people to have uh, values that align with every individual's personal values. So then finally, we look at environmental factors. And, and really, these are the most objective and measurable uh, criteria. So you can very clearly target environmental issues um, with a much more accuracy than you can the social and the governance side. And we'll get into a little bit about what some of those factors are and how you can do that. Um, but these are the ones that you can really say, okay, a company is doing X, which produces Y and has Z impact. It's, it's very linear. It's a lot easier to define. Derek, did I miss anything on that? No, those, those are great. And again, just the slight different, comparing the two different uh, kinds, the screen types where you're screening out, they tend to have uh, a smaller number of companies that they're involved in. So they don't have as much of a broad impact on the governance side of it at, at the boardroom table uh, for proxy votes and so on, which then in turn helps shape the social values that they're talking about and even some of the environmental issues. Uh, whereas the one where there's a, a tilt, they own, you know, as we saw from that illustration, they own many more companies. So they've got a seat at the table and have a little bit more influence uh, right across the board. So that's something that, that's beneficial as well. But as Christian said, uh, the social and the governance are so much harder to measure accurately and whose scale are you measuring on? Whereas environmental, which is what we'll get into now, is a little more scientific and you can measure it. So we'll take a look at a few of the things that go into the sustainability as the, the part of the environmental part that we'll look at. So for example, <clears throat> we'll take a look at greenhouse gas, em gas emissions intensity. Let's take automotives, automobiles, for example. Now, if I'm driving a car or my wife is driving a car or if a black person or a Chinese person or an Indian person is driving the same car, there's not gonna be any difference in the greenhouse gas emissions from the same vehicle. Uh, it really doesn't matter what your values are per se in that regard. Uh, it's simply a scientific fact. Now, if you're a young male, they tend to drive a little faster. So you might have a little more greenhouse gas emit emitted from, from those kind of guys. Uh, but by and large, a vehicle is going to emit a certain amount of emissions regardless of who's driving. So it's, again, much more objective. It's easier to measure and you say, here's what it is. Uh, potential emissions from, from reserves. So we're talking about again, uh, the oil and gas that's in the ground, uh, the different kind of mining and so on. Is there going to be some kind of uh, gases emitted from those reserves or when they're finished drilling or doing something, is something going to be released into the atmosphere? Uh, land use, biodiversity. Again, going back to that uh, forestry example, are they reforesting or are they simply just going through and clearing everything that they can because it's the fastest and cheapest way to go? Uh, and also, is it causing damage to the, uh, the, the local population of, of birds and animals and so on? You know, are, are there any wetlands left and those kind of things? So how is the company doing in, in that regard? And again, that's quite easily measurable. Uh, there are different industries, obviously, that uh, would be more prone to this, but toxic spills and releases. So uh, you've probably all seen, at least on TV, if not firsthand, uh, where there's been uh, 
a rail spill or a truck turned over on, on the 401 or something, that they've had gasoline or diesel or some other kind of toxic waste. And it's been uh, quite dis disconcerting to the people in the local area because it's, it's pretty toxic that, that's there. Uh, then also, how are they operating in their, in their own organization? Uh, is there a lot of waste that they're producing? Uh, companies are getting better at this, but you know you can go down. You know, Christmas wasn't that long ago. You buy some item that's uh, you know two inches by two inches, but it comes in a box that's uh, you know a foot by a foot with all sorts of foam and wrapping and plastic all over it. Again, they're getting better at that, but uh, it's still something there that that we can really take a look at, and and even things like the use of single-use plastics. You know, the charging a nickel at the grocery stores for uh, bags if you're not bringing a reusable one and doing away with uh, single-use straws and things like that. So all of these things are, are things that are measurable. Uh, water management. Some companies use a lot of water in the production of their particular product. Others don't. But still, how are they doing with the kind of uh, industry that they're involved in? Are they, again, uh, leaving pollution in the water? Are they cleaning up once they've used it? Are they using way more than, than they need to? Uh, so that's a very important aspect of that because there's only so much fresh water in the world. We've already touched on coal. Uh, it's been uh, seen as a real bad guy over the years as far as pollution. And that certainly seems to be in, uh, in remission and uh, probably go the way of the dinosaur within the next few years, at least in most of the industrialized countries. And palm oil is another example of uh, just again, the, uh, the potential impact on on our resources and sustainability. Did I miss anything, Christian? Oh, that was great, Derek. And you know, a lot of these factors, because of the scientific research behind them and the kind of objective criteria that are used, it's really easy to compare companies, not only just overall, but also do a relative comparison. So if we're looking at a large manufacturing plant versus a small manufacturing plant, it would be very easy to just say, oh, you know, the big plant produces a lot more greenhouse gases, so we're going to score them lower than the small plant. But how much is that big plant producing? If they're putting out a million units and the smaller plant is only putting out 100 units, but the greenhouse gas emissions are relatively similar or the small plant is only slightly less, well, then we could say, well, the bigger plant is actually much more efficient because they're producing a lot more units and producing a relatively same amount of emissions compared to this much smaller uh, plant. So we can do really, really deep and clear comparisons based on company size, um, you know, the amount of production they do and, and things like that. So it makes it a lot easier and a lot more scientific. Plus the science is really in on sustainability in terms of its impact to everyone. And it's not specific to a certain population or a certain demographic. There's been a lot of research that's come out on in climate change and things like that and the impact it's having on us. So now let's so, take a, oh, sorry, Derek. I was gonna say just uh, one thing on that. We're seeing a lot more companies now in their literature and uh, at least on uh, their mission statements and all that, they're talking about the three Ps. Uh, and they put it in this order, people, planet, and profits. Now, I'm not sure all of them live out things in, in that order, but at least it's becoming a little bit more common and more of a great buzzword to, to talk about it. So at least it's being mm -hmm. talked about. And uh, that's certainly something that you go back, you know, 50 or 100 years ago, probably wasn't talked about as, as much. Now, whether we're that much better off, <laughs> I'm not sure, uh, but at least the conversation is coming back to, to the forefront again, and people are taking action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great, great examples, Eric. So now let's take a little bit of a look at, you know, if we're gonna do some investing and we're gonna incorporate ESG, how does that impact our performance? Oftentimes, this is really one of the main questions we get when we're talking to clients about this, about ESG investing. So to start, especially when using screens, they're typically going to cost more, an ESG fund versus a non-ESG fund. There is added management, um, added work that goes into screening these companies through those ESG criteria, buying the information from the ratings firms, applying that and building a portfolio around those criteria. Um, now, typically, if we're looking at screens, they're going to be less diversified than the market. Tilts will as well, but to a, a lesser extent. 
because naturally we're, we're handpicking a certain companies and we're excluding companies. So naturally there's a little bit less diversification. Um, once again, that's one of the, those are both key uh, principles in terms of when we invest in creating an investment strategy, managing costs and diversification. And what the results were when we looked at the, the data is companies with higher ESG scores tended to do worse than companies with lower ESG scores. Now, this was a study that came out in 2019. Um, and really, when it's, a lot of it was looking at screens. And we, we talked a little bit earlier about some of the problems with ESG. So it's not necessarily a perfect comparison, but that was kind of the general information that had been coming out with ESG. Um, as a whole. So that's looking at all three factors. Now, when we look at sustainability specifically, we get a little bit of a different result. So when we apply environmental sustainability, the performance is actually not a lot different than the market as a whole. So this is looking at an example with uh, in the U.S. stock market, and it compares a market index fund of U.S. stocks with a sustainable market index fund. So this is using a tilt. So we've just remember a tilt is just excluding the worst offenders um, and taking and overweighting some of the better companies and taking a, a little bit from the below average. We still have some of the below average just, uh, when it comes to sustainability, um, but we're overweighting the above average. And you can see back from when this data set started back in 2008, the performance was largely the same up until about last year and, and the big just before the big dip we had last March. So, you know, when we apply a sustainability um, overlay or sustainability strategy to our investing, you know, it is very possible to get similar, if not slightly better returns. Now, once again, you know, the outperformance only appears in about 2019 to 2020. So it's a very small period of time. And we, we certainly don't want to um, look at a small period of time and, and try to extrapolate that to a, a long-term investment strategy. But you can see that over this kind of 12 year period, the performance was relatively the same. Derek, anything to add on that? Well, I'm just sort of sitting here smiling a little bit. I'm, I'm thinking the, and I don't have scientific proof to back this up, but I'm thinking one of the reasons that the sustainable companies performed a little bit better over the last little while is if you think back to the COVID, I, I'm sure they're trying to do a good job, but a lot of the energy companies tanked through 2020 with the lockdowns and so on. Uh, transportation companies, which use a lot of fuel, probably have a, a low ESG, a low sustainability score. Uh, shipping lines or cruise lines and so on. Uh, so a lot of those types of companies that uh, would have been lower on the sustainability score uh, did very poorly. So that would have pulled the overall index down while companies that were more sustainable, again, not really affected by the COVID lockdowns, uh, probably caused a little bit of performance, but that's just a, a personal uh, thought on that. Again, I haven't, couldn't back that up with uh, scientific proof, at least not at this point in time. Thanks, Derek. So Derek, why don't you take us through a little bit more on how can we implement some of these ESG factors outside of our investments. We, we took a look at, you know, sustainability can be applied pretty well within investments, but what about some of those other factors? How, how are we going to align our money with more of some of our personal values? Yeah. That's a great point. And, you know, as consumers, we're making a vote every time we spend some money. And, you know, companies are in business to make a profit. So they're going to want to provide products that you're willing to spend money on. So you have a lot more say than you think. And as one individual, you maybe don't have that much say, but you can certainly become involved in it and you can certainly help individual companies. You can uh, also let your, your values and, and the reasons you're doing things this way, uh, let, let it be known to other people around and you can you know, start a movement, so to speak. And there's been lots of that going on so just think of, um, you know, like over this last year, especially with, with COVID, um, when you're buying things, are you buying sustainable products? It's one thing to say, oh, I'm all about the environment. And then you go and buy a, a gas guzzling Hummer. Uh, it doesn't exactly line, line up with it. You're basically saying one thing, but doing another. Uh, what about foods? Uh, again, do you look for the 
cheapest food that, that's around, uh, wherever it came from, whatever chemicals they used it on, or are you saying, gee, I would like to make sure that you know, the, the food that we're putting into our bodies has been you know, maybe not totally organic, but it's been grown a, a little bit better. Um, same kind of thing we talked a little bit earlier about uh, the, um, like, uh, some of the clothing companies and so on that, uh, you know, what they call sweatshops in different countries where literally uh, sometimes fairly young children or old uh, folks are, are working with uh, very little pay and in very poor conditions. So there's a lot of products that come out that say are, you know, fair trade or um, yeah, I guess fair trade, like in coffees and clothing, all sorts of things, even your charitable giving. Uh, what organizations are you giving to? What kind of causes are they going to the front lines for and what are they helping? Um, again, locally shopping is something. And this uh, pandemic that we've been in for just a little over a year with all the lockdowns and, and so on, you have probably noticed there's a lot of small local companies that were forced to close because they weren't a Costco or a Walmart or something like that. I don't understand how they run all these rules, but that's not the purpose of this. Uh, but the thing is, is a lot of small shops, which were local people, not owned by international corporations or anything like that, were forced to close down. Uh, and as you might have noticed, a number of them have not opened back up again. And in fact, will not open back up. They've gone bankrupt or they've just closed down. Um, so that's an example, extreme example, of how you as a shopper can control uh, what's going, what's being offered for services. We didn't really control things through COVID, uh, but certainly when you go out and shop, if you go to a local farmer versus going to Costco or Bulk Barn or any of those uh, other places, uh, you're voting with your dollars. Uh, I've noticed, uh, you know, we try and eat pretty healthy. Noticed over the last couple of years that the organic section in the vegetable and fruit area has really expanded and the health food aisle in most stores, which used to be maybe half of an aisle, is now two or three aisles. So companies will provide uh, whatever you're willing to pay for. And if you're willing to pay for a little bit better quality, uh, or you're willing to say, you know, I, I want people to get paid a fair wage for doing this. I'm, I'm not going to have everything made in China or India or some of these other countries where wages are very low, working conditions aren't nearly as good. And that's the only reason that they're cheaper than, than what they are here. If they had the same standards in China and uh, India and a lot of these other countries, uh, when you add in the shipping charges, uh, the, the stuff manufactured from those countries would not be any cheaper. So what we do really has a, a huge impact. And so while it's great to think about your investment dollars and what are your investment dollars doing, I would say personally, my personal opinion is that you actually uh, vote more and have more power as a consumer than you do as an investor. Uh, unless you're, you know, have millions of shares and you have some controlling interest in, in a company. But as a, an individual investor, investing in multi-million dollar companies, uh, you don't likely have much say in how they're being operated, but what you spend your money on certainly has a huge impact. So just to give you some examples, companies are always trying to make you think that you should buy something and that it's good for you. So how many of you still have green ketchup around? Uh, Heinz did that for a couple of years and uh, you know the novelty was okay for a couple of years, but they took it off the market. I think it was lasted about three or four years. How about purple ketchup or blue ketchup? They tried those as well, but they didn't last nearly as long. Uh, one of the biggest foopas probably uh, was in 1957, the Ford Motor Company had spent $400 million uh, to produce the Edsel, which was a you know, pretty fancy car. Unfortunately, uh, all the marketing and all the money they spent on it uh, didn't result in many sales. So within four years, they'd stopped that. Uh, another one, New Coke, which was introduced, I think it was in the uh, 80s. Uh, they changed the recipe. It was a dismal failure. And very quickly, it came off the shelf. And they came back with the original, which they now call Classic Coke. And it's still been their bestseller. So companies are always trying to find ways to make money. 
And you're the one that really gives them the ideas. If you're going to buy something, if you're going to spend money on, on something and they can make a profit at it, uh, they're going to be very happy to, to produce for you. So you have a lot more control over uh, what goes on uh, than, than you might think. And every time you go out and, and shop and the things that you buy are really creating that, that bigger picture. And, and we can't, uh, you know, we can't always bring our own water bottle. There's times when we're out, uh, especially going to airports and stuff like that. You have to buy something and maybe it's in a plastic container and so on. But uh, how aware are we personally, each one of us individually, at the little impact that we have. Because if we can have an impact and then we extend that to our family and then to our friends and so on, uh, we can have a huge impact on what goods are being produced, uh, what, what, what goods are being profitable, what's going on in the environment. So that's my, um, my soapbox for, uh, for values. Uh, and Christian, you wanna stand on your soapbox now and uh, give, them, give them some thoughts? I think you covered it really well. At the end of the day, we vote with our dollar. How we spend our money is going to impact how companies produce products. And you can see, and Derek kind of alluded to it earlier, um, while there's not a, a, maybe a ton of evidence, you could make an argument that you know, sustainable companies may do a little bit better in the future because people are starting to vote more with their dollar and be more aware of what goes into the products that they're creating. Now, let's, we can never use the G word and say that that's guaranteed to happen, um, but it's a thought and it really depends on, you know, how or what are you going to do differently going forward? Are you going to look a little closer at the, at the products you buy, whether it's the food you buy, the, the clothes you buy, the companies you give to? You know, how are you going to vote with your dollars going forward? Um, so that really wraps up everything we had on values-based investing. Um, if you do have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat box below. We did have a question submitted beforehand that we're going to touch on. It, it's not quite linked to values-based investing, but we'll still address it anyway. Um, so the question that came in was, when we look at value and growth stocks, what do we think is going to perform best over the long term? Um, now, it's once again, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen looking forward or going in the future, but we can look at a, a number of years of history um, and the historical data in Canada, the US and around the world and get some ideas. So just a reminder, value stocks are ones whose the stock price is closer or less uh, when compared to the earnings of the actual company whereas growth stocks have a higher stock price compared to the earnings of the company. Um, and based on the historical data, over the long run, value stocks tend to outperform growth stock because you're paying less for that dollar, future dollar of earnings than you are with a growth stock. Um, so once again, growth stocks recently have had quite a run, um, a lot of it being led by the big tech companies um, who is you know, maybe not as profitable or some of them are not profitable, but whose stock prices are shooting through the roof. Um, so they've really led a, a very big surge in growth companies. Um, but when we look at you know, the last 100 years of US data and 50 years of Canada, Canadian data and other data from around the world, there's quite um, a lot of evidence that points to value stocks outperforming growth in the long run. That's not to say you shouldn't own growth stocks. We're still very big believers in diversification. But when we talk, when we look at the two, the evidence is points towards value outperforming growth. Derek, anything to add on that? Uh, it's a great, great example or a great uh, definition and uh, summary of that. I'm going to give up what I consider a practical example. It's a fictitious example. Because people think, oh, well, a growth stock is, you know, a tech company or this and a value stock is, uh, you know, like a bell count or, or something. And I want to take that away from you. It's really about what is the company basically worth if you just took the pieces and sold them off versus what you think it's going to earn over the, the future. So you can be a growth stock one year and a value stock the next year and you're still the same company. So my fictitious example is, I've got a little flower shop, just uh, run it myself. I've got a $20,000 used delivery van and $20,000 worth of inventory and flowers. But I've got some great contracts with funeral homes and the hospitals and so on. And I net, after paying everything off, I net myself $100,000 a year 
in, in income. But I'm getting, getting on in years and think it's time to retire. So I'm putting it up for sale. Now, because I, uh, that's such a low overhead business, I can run it by myself, it's easy. I expect to get at least two times the value of, of the sales or the net sales that I get. So I'm asking $200,000 for this business. And if any of you have ever been in business and think, hey, I could buy this business and have it all paid off in two years, that's like buying a home and saying, I'm gonna take a two year mortgage because I can get it paid off in two years. It's a pretty good deal. Uh, because, hey, two years you work uh, hard and you've got all your money back and then it's just pure profit after that. So uh, you come in and you say, okay, well, Derek, I'll think about it. I'll look, see about the financing and then all that. So you come back a week, a week later and there's a sign on the door that says, uh, sorry, uh, not working, uh, try again later. And you do a little bit of digging and find out that I've had a heart attack and I'm in the hospital. So you wait a few days and, you know, and it's now two weeks. You come and you visit me. You say, Derek, are you still interested in selling your, uh, your flower business? Um, I said, well, yeah, I'm, I'm still uh, interested in doing that. I'm not sure if I'm going to get out of here anytime soon, or I certainly won't want to be working a lot. So I say, well, look, Derek, you know, you're a nice guy and all that, but uh, I'll give you like you know, $50,000, and that's a really good deal. I'm going, like two weeks ago, you were willing to give me $200,000. What's, what's changed? said, well, your $20,000 worth of flowers are dead. So that's gone. You've got a $20,000 van. And who knows how many of those customers have now gone somewhere else because you haven't been there to serve them. There's no guarantee those customers will come back to me. Maybe they just uh, thought that you were a good guy and they, they shopped there because of you. Uh, and now they're, they've gone to somebody else. So uh, I'm taking a big risk on this. If I get half the customers back, then, you know, okay, it's not a bad deal. Uh, but so there's, that's the example when the business is running profitably, it's a growth company. It's making all sorts of money with really very little of actual value in what's inside it other than the customer list, uh, and a value company. It's now basically trading just for what you could take the pieces apart and, and sell for. So that's to me, a, a pretty good example that people can sort of Get, oh, okay, so you know, Walmart can be a growth company one year and a value company the next year. Depends what happens to their share price. Uh, same thing with Google or Facebook or Bell or any, any of those companies. So it's not a particular type of company. It's how they're priced. And as Christian has, has very well articulated, uh, historically, when, you, when you're be, being able to buy you know, pretty much fair price uh, for the assets that are there, and there's some uh, potential for it to grow in the future, you tend to have much greater return because you're starting from a lower point of what it costs you. So if you have any kind of increase, you're doing that much better. Um, great. I, I'm gonna add just uh, one thing, which is not really related to value and growth so much, but it's, I remember this was back quite a number of years ago. He's now retired, but uh, a very uh, well, respected and very successful uh, fund manager. Uh, I think, I can't even, I think the fund, first fund came, it was called the ethical fund, you know? And so of course there was some, you know, oh, this is going to be a fund that's going to be good. It's not going to invest in, you know, in weapons and this and that. And the manager, uh, he had to me a very good philosophy and he was a very successful investor. Uh, he says, look, he said, at the end of the day, company has to make money. And so if people are willing to pay for those kind of things and, and, and buy this or that or support that company, it will do well. But if there's not enough people that, quote, follow that ethical thing, uh, then that company is not going to do very well. And he says, so companies are very sharp. And if they see a trend moving somewhere, even though they don't have ethical, he says, I don't particularly look for, quote, uh, ethical screens. He says, but the companies that are growing and are going to continue to grow, they're always adapting to what consumers want. So as they see this movement starting to go towards environmental or you know, whatever it is, if that's within their wheelhouse of what product or service they're producing, he says, they're going to move that way anyhow. So again, by how we shop and how we spend our money, we're driving those companies to produce what we want and what we value. Like there's any more questions coming in. Um, so once again, thank you everyone for joining us on our webinar tonight. We appreciate you taking the time. 
and to go through the subject with us. The recording will be posted on our website. So if you know anyone who would like to have been here but wasn't able to make it, um, there's, your, there's their opportunity to watch it again. Um, if you do have any other questions that come up after this, please feel free to send us an email and let us know and we'd be happy to help. Derek, anything to add before we sign off? Well, we're letting you off a few minutes early so you can uh, do some Easter bunny hiding eggs and stuff like that and uh, all the other good things that Easter represents. So have yourself a great Easter weekend and hope to see many of you soon. Bye for now. Mm -hmm. Have a great Take evening. Care.